We are delighted to be joined by uh, Ambassador Martin Kimani, uh, who is, you know, is Kenya's permanent representative to the United Nations, who will be here to brief you uh, on the um, seventh biennial meeting of the states to consider the implementation of the program of action to prevent combat and uh, eradicate the illicit trade in small arms and light weapons in all its aspects. And uh, Ambassador, welcome. Sir, if you could also introduce your guest, that would be great, because I don't have his name. Thank you. Take yes, please, you may take yeah. off the mask. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Stefan, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, and thank you all for taking the time to listen to me. My name is Martin Kimani. I'm Kenya's permanent rep to the United Nations. I'm joined here by my friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Ivor Fung, who is a senior political affairs officer and the deputy chief of the conventional arms branch of the Office of Disarmament Affairs. Um, and he's going to help me in case you have very technical questions on uh, the deep technical issues that we were debating on. Um, I don't want to make a speech of it, and rather, rather interact with the questions that you have. Um, the seventh biennial meeting uh, was one of those processes that, to me, uh, was directly about saving lives. Uh, if you look at the impact of uh, small arms and light weapons today, um, it is no exaggeration to say that in terms of human security, in terms of humanitarian crisis, in terms of sheer human suffering, there are probably very few rivals to the use of this weaponry. And 20 years ago, um, states came together to try and find ways to improve how these weapons are regulated, um, how the stockpiles are managed, um, and to make sure that they're properly and reliably marked um, to um, cooperate better in how to trace weapons so that if an illicit weapon is found having harmed someone in one country, it can be traced back to its origin and there can be a sense of response across borders and globally to that and to try and engage in regional and international cooperation because different states are different levels of regulation and capability. And they came up with a program of action. And what we were doing uh, at BMS 7, as it was called, was every two years states come together uh, to consider the implementation of that program of action and the international tracing instrument, uh, which was adopted um, uh, 16 years ago. Um, and so this is a framework of cooperation where every member state is bringing essentially its national and human security interests to the table and negotiating a common way forward. I was privileged to chair this year's BMS 7, and I think it was, it was a very difficult process. This, of, this is one of the disarmament conferences, and I think this was the first disarmament conference to happen since uh, the beginning of COVID. And it meant delegates having to dial in on, um, on, on digital platforms, which made negotiation so much more difficult. Um, nevertheless, um, we were able to make some accomplishments. Um, one, we got it through with a unanimous, unanimous, unanimous vote um, of 114 with zero abstentions and zero no's. Um, and critically, for the first time, there was language on ammunition. This is something that has been very difficult to get consensus and agreement on. There was language on ammunition in the outcome document that was achieved without a vote. The last time the, the language was included, uh, the United States and Israel called for a vote. This time, the two of them embraced the language in, um, in, the, in, the, in the outcome document. And so I've, this is a big shift for the small arms community. Um, it means, at long last, the issue of ammunition is squarely on the agenda of the program of action. We also got forward momentum on issues of how uh, gender is treated, how gender is treated across the chain of the program of action. Um, and this was really very much thanks to the leadership of Costa Rica that got together um, um, 64, 64 member states to really push and say that the issue of gender could not be kept out of the program of action. Uh, there was also a lot of, um, uh, there was a new understanding that this instrument needs to interact and with other instruments better um, for us basically to become more than the sum of our parts. 
um, in the future, um, we agreed that there'll be an open-ended working group on new technologies. It's something we're going to discuss um, at BMS uh, 8, and, and there are some financial and technical proposals that will come through. But that what, basically what it means is that we're catching up with this rapid um, growth of technologies in the small and light weapons space and trying to keep all countries moving along uh, that path. And right next to it is going to be the future establishment of a training fellowship uh, for developing countries because the technology is moving so fast and the financial and technical barriers to actually keeping up with it uh, are costly enough that um, some countries need more help than others. And so we discuss that. Um, and finally, we're going to have um, um, s setting up of voluntary national and regional targets on program of action implementation. And I think that's going to bring a sense of accountability and forward, forward momentum. So for me, it was a great honor to uh, chair that event um, and for Kenya to continue pressing how important um, taking on illicit small and light weapons in all their aspects is to our country. In June this year, President Kenyatta burnt about 5,000 illicit uh, weapons. Uh, we've been a regional leader in this area. So it's something we come to as a country, not just as diplomats here in New York, but just understanding the profound and negative impact that illicit weapons can have on our population. So with that, I'm very happy to take your questions. If I'm unable to take them from a technical level, Ivo will help me. Um, if they're completely impossible, Stefan will take them. <laughs> <laughs> That's really bad. If it comes down to me, we're, I, I, we're in I, trouble. Yeah. So, so thank you very much, members of, of the press. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, Edie Letter, Associated Press. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. And on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association, thank you for doing this briefing. Um, I have two questions. First, um, the vote was 114 to 0 to 0. That means that there are about 80 countries that um, are not participating. Um, is this reflective of the difficulties that the Treaty on Small Arms and Light Weapons has had in gaining global support, more global support. And secondly, um, when you say that ammunition is now on the agenda, um, can you explain what actually is in the final document and and what does that mean? Thank you. I'm going to um, first say I think there were quite a number of delegations that were having a hard time just participating on the basis of, uh, of what the, the pandemic uh, has meant. Um, normally, they would travel to New York, um, but there were great difficulties. Uh, but I think the, the, the vote of 114 to 0 is I think very indicative of a, of a strong consensus in this area. Um, in terms of the past, Ivo, would you say, is it indicative you think of that there could be some limits to how there are countries that are not participating in the process? And also, if you don't mind me just giving him the difficult questions, I'll take the easy ones. <laughs> and, 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 and also, um, if the issue of ammunition, why you know, if we can go deeper into just beyond the language, beyond the language of the resolution, the meaning, what, what, what it means for, for, for people. I'll, I'll say on that second question, what I, one of the things many delegations have had a problem with is, look, if we're talking about um, an illicit AK-47, an illicit AK-47 does not do the damage it does without the ammunition, right? Um, and... This seems commonsensical, uh, but for some reason there are countries that were really strongly opposed to it. Thankfully, there's another process going on in parallel uh, where countries are actually discussing the issue of ammunition. And so what the document says is it, it 
it takes note that this process is happening. And when it's completed and those recommendations come, which should be this year, or is it next year? Yes. This year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then we shall have more robust language about how to address the threat from ammunition itself um, in the program of action. That's going to be another debate. That's going to be another debate. How precisely do you do it? Uh, how, how, how robust will these efforts be? There's another debate coming up, but for now we have that opening. It's an opportunity, but it's an opportunity that's been fought for for 20 years um, and only came now. I don't know if I voted. Mr. Ambassador, I think uh, you answer the question uh, as an expert, as a technician, so I don't think there was any uh, much information that I can bring. On the first question, I, I think, uh, yes, the 114 is a reflection of uh, the global uh, membership that attended, but uh, as the Ambassador has, has explained, uh, COVID played a big role in uh, the participation of state. Uh, uh, many that even participated uh, virtually um, could not because the sessions, you know, with the different time zones, uh, and we were here operating on New York time zone, uh, that also contributed to, to it. But uh, 114 was a resounding number. Um, uh, of those that participated, uh, I, I mean, in the voting, yes. With regard to the issue of ammunition, uh, as the ambassador has explained, ammunition, there is a different track which is uh, in the General Assembly through a resolution dedicated on the issue of surplus ammunition. It's been there. In 2001, when the um, uh, program of action on small arms and light weapon was adopted, states did not agree to include ammunition. And so a separate path, a separate process has been launched. And uh, that process has uh, assumed uh, an advanced level of uh, functioning uh, with the establishment by the Secretary General at the request of uh, the General Assembly of a group of governmental experts just to look at the issue of ammunition. And that group of governmental experts would be submitting uh, its, uh, its report uh, this September uh, to, the, uh, to, to, the general, uh, to, to the Secretary General and to the General Assembly. Uh, so there is a parallel process. And what the framework of the program of action on small arms and uh, light weapons captures and captured this year was a recognition of the existence of this parallel process and also a recognition of the fact that in the management, in the implementation of the program of action, there are states that apply ammunition to their implementation effort. So these are the two areas of uh, acknowledgement that were reflected in the, prog uh, on, in the outcome document of the BMA 7. Any other questions? Uh, Amanda? Hi there. Thanks so much for the briefing. Amanda from Al Jazeera. Um, Amanda from Al Jazeera. Uh, thanks for this briefing. Um, hoping that perhaps you could shed a bit more light on kind of what the concrete impact of uh, what has been agreed this year would have on the ground and, you know, any conflict perhaps on the Security Council agenda, you could look at DRC, up to you um, in terms of how you answer this question. But um, in terms of, you know, what, what kind of impact we could see on the ground as a result of these decisions being taken here would be useful. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for that question. I think that's a question, you know, people at home would have. Uh, as, as opposed to uh, us diplomats here in New York. Uh, one, I think um, what we can, the program of action is a program where you basically undertake to reduce illicit small arms and light weapons. And those, almost by definition, are what are causing so much damage in many countries. 
Uh, but different states have different capabilities. In fact, uh, part of the reason why you're, you have the problems you have in some countries that not are files in the Security Council is the inability to control um, the flow of these weapons. Uh, like if you look across the Sahel and you look at the, um, the, the weapons that flowed from, from, from Libya. Um, so one, it's to, one of the impacts is the more we implement the program of action, the more it limits the, the, the continuing flow of these weapons. So perhaps the spots that are in the, the hot spots in the worst trouble may have a very hard time because some of the states are struggling to just sustain their security, forget um, undertaking efforts to, 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 uh, to completely disarm all the fighting groups. But in states that are fragile, but not yet in, in, in big trouble, the work of disarmament of small, illicit small and light weapons can be what prevents your fragilities from developing into a hotspot that ends up downstairs at, at the Security Council. So there's, there's that piece. Then the other piece is that we are all going to need to start addressing the role of small and light weapons in peacekeeping missions. We're going to need to, to have a more robust conversation about um, um, uh, weapons sales and weapons tracing. And those are the things that are going to have an impact on people's lives. So what a program like, what a conference like this does is once again shed light on the problem, once again lay out what are solutions and get countries to sign up. Right. And so if people at home are wondering, is it worth it? Yes, it's worth it because there's a way when all states agree together. If you're a state that either facilitates uh, or in, in whatever form of fashion the flow of illicit small and light weapons, it puts a spotlight on that behavior. If you're a state that has signed up to the program of action and you're not undertaking any of the aspects of weapons tracing and marking, it puts a spotlight on it. Um, it allows the reformers and the people on the ground who, who want to fight these weapons to have something they can hold on to. It allows civil society to tell the government, you signed on to these commitments, you, you went, negotiated and agreed on them, now do them. Um, and that's one of the things where, even in the outcome document, you can see it appreciating the role of civil society. So I take it to be um, an opportunity and a platform that allows us to hold our governments more accountable, allows us in government to have a more structured and concerted way to save our citizens' lives. And that's how it then has an impact on people's lives. So it's a long explanation but i that's what i interpreted we were doing and now when it comes to issues like new technologies you know um the way guns are marked now the way they remove the markings uh the materials being used uh to make weapons um they're becoming this just leaps and bounds of development um and countries being left behind and what that means is that today there could be a weapon that can be hidden in somebody's um bag that's much more difficult to detect. Um, every country is going to need to, to know how to do that. That's going to make our airports safer. It's going to make our cities safer. It's going to make our facilities safer. So that's a connection I see. Thank you very much. <laughs> Evelyn Leopold, we'll go to the screen. Evelyn? <laughs> Thank you very much for the very interesting briefing. You've certainly made some remarkable progress. But uh, the manufacture of weapons is big, 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 big business. And what controls do you see in either reducing it or the, the businesses being responsible and for the tracing of it? Thank or is that a dream? <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, you know, um, Different countries come to the to the table um, on on the this meeting of states and the program of action with different with different inherent interests. Uh, there are those states that have um, companies 
that are the major producers of these of, of these weapons. Um, they're and and th those countries have different characters. There's some that are a lot more responsible than others. Um, there are countries that are, are the net recipients of uh, illicit small and light weapons that compromise uh, their security. Um, there are also countries that need small and light weapons for their self-defense uh, under Article 51. And they need um, the program of action and similar disarmament agreements to not limit in any way their ability to access weapons. So what I'm trying to say is that there are quite a number of political agendas uh, that all meet uh, at, at the table. Uh, and that's where the ferocity of the debate comes from. Um, it, it, sometimes it sounds like very minor points, like very technical UN diplomat speak. But when you look beneath it, is very potent and strong interests coming through. Now, um, what I noticed is that um, all these interests have to finally be agreed, have to finally be uh, uh, balanced out. And so when that vote of 114 to 0, what it told me is that there was a balance. Uh, and what a balance sometimes means that we don't go far enough. For instance, for the weapons manufacturers, sometimes we may not go far enough in holding them accountable um, um, because of the political interests that are pursued by the states in which they um, uh, are based. Uh, but on balance, I think the fact that there was such a strong um, un unanimous decision means that everyone got their piece of the pie. And you know, somebody told me, um, uh, it was mentioned several times at the conference, that a sign of a good conference is everyone is really dissatisfied. And everyone just just thinks, well, you know, this was, this, was, this was bad for me. Uh, as a chair, that's what I'm aiming for. So I think we achieved that. Um, as to, are we going far enough? Because your question is an important question. Are we going far enough to holding arms manufacturers uh, uh, and transporters uh, accountable? I think we, sh we can do a lot more, and we should do a lot more. Um, and that's why this debate is so important. <clears throat> thank you very much. Ambassador, thank you uh, very much. I don't see any uh, other questions. I think you've left the journalists satisfied. Oh, hi, so, Stefan. Oh, sorry. Stefan, sorry, yes. it's, it's James Reinel here James. From, uh, from the National. Go ahead, I do, I do apologize. I put, oh, I, I, I put my name down, but it wasn't in the all panelists section. Oh, okay. uh, if the ambassador could kindly indulge me for one more question, that'd be really appreciated. Please. Go ahead. Sure, Jane. Go yeah, ahead. Thank, thanks so much. I mean, you, you know, you've been talking about a really important issue. The focus is on this contraband manufacture, supply and sale in guns and ammo. Um, I've spoken to a bunch of my colleagues in the field and colleagues who work for the Small Arms Survey, and they've been noticing a new paradigm to the problem, and that is that these armed groups that your governments in Africa are coming up against, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, and groups like that, one of their other ways of getting hold of guns and ammo is they actually launch attacks on, for example, peacekeeping, ANASOM, multinational joint task force bases and uh, groups and seize their caches of weapons, their guns and ammo. And they're building up quite large supplies of, uh, 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 of, of weapons by doing this. Um, this is what my colleagues from the field are telling me, and they're pointing to lots and lots of attacks in lots of different places that build up to a picture that this is a serious problem. I'm just wondering if it's a problem that you view at the intergovernmental level. Uh, are your colleagues in the Security Council, in UN peacekeeping, in AMISOM, in the MGTF, are you aware of this issue? Do you see it as a problem? And is it something that you and your colleagues are going to be able to take action against? James, I think that is um, a very important observation, and I think it is based on reality. And uh, your friends who are in the field are reflecting on a very real problem. Um, I have noticed, I don't have um, an analysis, a quantitative analysis that shows how frequently and the full breadth of, of, of these occurrences, but clearly uh, terrorists and insurgent organizations are gaining part of their weaponry from attacking um, um, state 
establishments, state institutions, whether these are police stations with armories or... Um, but deliberately seeking new weaponry uh, or better weaponry through attacking um, uh, legitimate legal forces. Uh, I think there's a lot more that needs to be done in terms of stockpile management uh, within the peacekeeping environment. Um, I think that's something Kenya, which uh, we are, we are, we have, uh, we are in the security, we are an elected member of the Security Council now. That's something certainly we would want to have a conversation about in the Security Council to make sure that peacekeeping forces are given all the support to be able to better protect their equipment uh, and their weapons uh, from these very deliberate attacks. So I think, James, you've put on the table um, something that I know uh -huh. Kenya is interested in pursuing as a conversation in the Security Council. Uh, and hopefully we will in the coming weeks and months. Weeks. I, I don't know, James, if Ivo has something to say on this. <laughs> No, just to mention, James, that, uh, yeah, the question is very uh, right to the point. And to mention that, uh, in fact, one of the mandates assigned to the BMA-7 from the 2018 okay. review conference was the issue of diversion, how weapons from when they are manufactured to where they are uh, supposed to end up, how do they remain in a controlled situation and not find themselves in the wrong hands. And what you are uh, putting your hands on is rightly uh, what the BMA-7 tried to grapple with with regard to the issue of diversion of weapons uh, uh, to what they call unauthorized recipients. Yes, member states uh, discussed the issue and um, some new language on how to approach it has, uh, has been addressed. And, uh, as the ambassador has also pointed out, the issue of m marking contributes to this. And weapons have to be marked not just when they get to the countries, but right from industry. And that's why a debate, the dialogue with the industry in this whole process is also very much important to be sure that weapons do not end up in the wrong hands. And this was, again, as I've said, uh, one of the mandates of the BMS-7. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Evo Ambassador, thank you both uh, very much for uh, coming out today. And we hope to see you soon for an update whenever you want. And you're always welcome here. Thank you. Thank you.